Uh, so I am Bill Mee, and I'm a full-time lecturer here. And excuse me. And I actually, when I heard Mickey was speaking, I asked to introduce him. And so it's a real honor <laughs> to be introducing Mickey. Uh, he is the truest American icon of fashion, casual fashion and retailing. And he's also been a bit of a friend to me and a role model for creativity and leadership for just under 20 years. Now, Mickey and I have something in common which you won't guess. We both went to high school in the Bronx. <laughs> and he went to Bronx High School in Science, which if you're from New York knows that that means that at 14 or 15, Mickey was a very smart young man <laughs> who, started, who studied very hard. Uh, after college, he apprenticed at three of New York's great department stores, Abraham and Strauss, Macy's and Bloomingdale's, and when we were in the waiting room, he told us that he hated his first 10 years of work. At 36, he was hired by Ann Taylor, which was the first fashion chain that he led and soon transformed it. In 1983, you joined the Gap? Gap to join Inc., where he, at that point, was uh, a few Gap stores where you could buy records and Levi's, and he turned it into America's first great casual apparel chain. He later turned around a small set of stores called Banana Republic and turned it into the Banana Republic you know today, created Gap Kids, and then created and built Old Navy, which was really the first uh, fashion uh, value chain in our country. He was president of Gap Inc. from 1987 to 1985, and he was CEO until he left in 2002. In 2003, he became director, chair, and CEO of J. Crew, which was then quite a moribund uh, brand uh, and set of apparel. Uh, he took it uh, to a very strong turnaround and took that tired and focused brand and turned it into the very vital and successful $2 billion chain that it is today. In addition, he has been a director of Apple for 19, since 1999. And though uh, Steve Jobs isn't with us, with us anymore, you could have charged admission, I'm sure, to conversations between Mickey and Steve, eye to eye. More than anybody else, if you look around the room, Mickey Drexler is the reason almost all of you are dressed the way you are. <laughs> every khaki, every piece of denim, every shirt, every sweater was either created by Mickey or one of his people or reshaped uh, or recolored in some important way. Uh, before I turn it over to Mickey, I'm going to share just a few brief personal observations. I was at McKinsey for 30 years, uh, and only so I can position Mickey against them, I will mention that amongst the CEOs I served were Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, Steve Jobs, albeit when he was at Next, John Chambers, Jim Coulter, TPG, Catherine Graham, Punch Salzberger, Howard Lester, uh, who was the, I don't think he'd call himself this, the Mickey Drexler of Williams and Sonoma, and several others who are also excellent leaders but don't have the brand name Panache. And so my introduction to Mickey is that he was and is, at his best and even at his average, the most creative, inspiring, smart, and I might add, the most demanding of all of them, and easily the most fun. Creative, inspiring, smart, and demanding. His ability to understand consumers, to see color, shape, and texture to which most of us would be completely blind, to understand lifestyle, indeed the mindset of each successive generation. This is truly distinctive but well known. But he was and is also a great businessman and a leader. While he was no accountant <coughs> by any means, I never heard Mickey come up with a fashion idea that structurally was not ready to make a lot of money. What's the most volume of an item you've ever ordered? Oh, oh, gee, I'd have to think about that. But a million? Oh, easily, yeah. Ten million. Well, it's a long story, but you just give me a Yeah, give so me a hundreds of thousands. Bill. I mean, just imagine deciding that, you know, next spring. Well, it, it, 
Yeah, you have to measure downside. Well, upside. Absolutely. Mi yeah. Hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of those sweaters. But it takes, you know, uh, it, there's a story about how it starts. Uh, uh, okay, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I got to okay. finish the compliment. Okay, go ahead. But you weren't an accountant, but he always knew how to price goods. And remember, he is called the great merchant prince, and a merchant, above all, knows how to make money. Now, in my career, I had no thrill greater than spending two hours with Mickey in the first Old Navy store in Manhattan as he went around and toured it and looked at every object, every business process, uh, every uh, piece of apparel there. And the way you could see that he could see and understand and integrate all the elements of fashion retailing and to do it with the most engaging monologue uh, that you could ever hear. So with great personal and general enthusiasm on behalf of the business school, I welcome Mickey Drexler. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. All two. You know, I, uh, I was a little concerned about this being taped, but now I'm very happy after that introduction. Bill and I, he didn't say, we go way back. We fought a lot. Uh, he was actually, uh, was a Gap uh, for many years off and on, and he was really part of the team. And uh, too long, too many arguments and too many disagreements that I even care to think about. But uh, it's really nice to see him here today. Uh, and uh, that was probably the best introduction I've ever had. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really nice. I don't have an agenda or set a speech. I asked my hosts and hostesses what I'd like, what I should talk about. And every time I said something like, I didn't like my first 10 years of life in business, they'd always say that. Uh, when there's no perfect job, oh, say that. Oh, I didn't learn much from most of my bosses. Oh, say that. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the way I learned to buy goods, by the way, was interesting. This bill reminded me, and I don't have hours tonight, but when I was a young baby buyer at Bloomingdale's, it was my first job, Bloomingdale's after school. And I uh, ended up buying, well, this doesn't, I don't know if it sounds like a lot. In it. How many of you were actually in retailing or worked in retailing? Raise your hands. So not a lot. Anyone I work with here? I know there's two or three people at Stanford undergraduate, one whose mom works here. I don't want to embarrass you, works at uh, Stanford, and someone I met in the store today. Where are you? Whoever works at J. Crew now, raise your hands for full disclosure. They didn't show up. OK, that's good. <laughs> um, they said they'd be here. Anyway. Um, my first big buy was actually at Bloomingdale's where I had a fight with the whole line of command uh, up in to, to the CEO about buying a t-shirt that I wanted to buy more than they've ever purchased before. But I kind of learned mostly on my own about being a merchandiser and being a business person and learning from people who, um, who maybe didn't teach me, but they taught me how not to do it or they taught me how to be argumentative. And I always like to argue. I argued Bill over many, many things over the years. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I learned over time to kind of follow my own internal judgment. Now, at, at your stage in life, you don't follow the internal judgment as much as one does when they get older, more wiser, make many mistakes in your life and business. Uh, but at some point now, and especially now, where I love what I do, and he didn't say I was fired, by the way, which I don't know, he knew that very well because he's probably part of the reason I was fired. <laughs> Kinsey comes in. You know, McKinsey comes in, they say, oh, I think it's time for a new CEO. You know what happens? <laughs> so, uh, I told you you should retire nine months before. Right, he told me to get out. And by the way, I was trying to get out because it's, because it's no fun running a company that doesn't have much growth left. And mostly in America, in my opinion, everything I say is the opinion of, it's personal editorial here. Uh, in fact, I went on the loudspeaker today. I was flying out from New York this morning, and I said, Everyone says Skyball is a must-see. I said, personal opinion is the most overrated, too-long movie I've ever seen in my life, and so tacky. And then I said, and by the way, Flight got great reviews, the movie. I said, it was a horrible movie. And what airplane flies upside down and doesn't crash? So I've, I've learned that the world doesn't have the kind of quality it needs to have, that they keep, they keep uh, and I mean this, they keep re referring to old things to try to make them new. I saw the preview of watching Skyball on Saturday was Die Hard again. Uh, and you know, the world, one thing being on the board of 14 years with Steve, who I miss tremendously, uh, is the fact that you move forward, you figure out where things are going, and then you make a very, uh, you base your risk and investment on upside and downside. When I buy goods or when we buy goods, it's the same thing. So I started my career at Bloomingdale's. Why? 
because I got a job offer at A&S where I had a summer MBA job. They offered me $10,500 a year. I'll never forget this. And these are all little signals about your life and about where you go. So I, I uh, recommended a friend of mine who was a finance guy from, uh, from uh, my class. And they offered him 11000 a year. So I'm speaking to him. And I said, they offered you eleven, me ten and a half thousand. They knew me. I worked there for three months. I was furious and pissed off. And to me, it said a lot more than the five hundred dollars, which was important when you don't have money. Uh, and then five hundred was probably worth three thousand a year or whatever it is today. And I said, I'm not going to work here. I went to work at Bloomingdale's. Thank God. Uh, and Bloomingdale's then was kind of becoming what it became, and now it's not anymore because most department stores are discount stores to me today. But I think it's, you start to figure out and learn from all those little things you see uh, in your life. And then I always quote Steve on this from his Stanford speech. And see, I, I like to take credit for it, but since I'm at Stanford, I can't say you connect the dots backwards. Because you probably know, I don't know, would anyone know that that's what he said in the speech? You can, so I use that all the time. And it's very true about life. You can't figure it out at the beginning stages as you're in, but you figure it out and you look at where your career goes or where your life goes or where other things go, and then you connect it. Uh, you kind of connected backwards. So I went to work at Bloomingdale's. I was very lucky to work for a woman. In those days, women were like sometimes not seriously taken. But the rest, I work with eight out of 10 women on our senior executive level. Eight of 10 of them are women, because I actually like working with women more so, no offense against men, because we have some men in finance and some men in merchandising and so on and so forth. But I learned from Katie Murphy, may she rest in peace, who died at a much too young age, about you buy what you like, you figure out what's happening, color is important, style's important, and all that's important. Now, if you kind of look at it, same thing with Apple, by the way. It was always the same factors about being creative, figuring out where the puck is going, as Wayne Gretzky said. Uh, so, uh, so my first few years, I loved my first year and a half at Bloomingdale's, and then I became an executive. I was a buyer, a merchant. You buy the goods. You argued in the sense I bought 30,000 T-shirts. They wanted me to buy 6,000. And you figure if, an, if, a, if a day in February you can sell in cold weather, and this is East Coast only, X amount of T-shirts, well, what does that mean for a full day or a week or a month in May or June? It's complicated, so I won't get into detail on that. I spent, I spent six years at Bloomingdale's. Didn't really, I can say didn't really, well, some of my bosses might hear this. They were all nice and some of them are still friends. But I didn't really learn anything other than what I kept teaching myself what Katie in the early year or two would teach me. Went to work at then Macy, spent a year and a half there and said this is really not good and suck up is important, what suit you wear is important. And I think that's true in a lot of corporations today. And then I went to A&S and that was it. I spent four years there and I got a job offer at uh, at Ann Taylor, and I wasn't going to take it, but a friend of mine said, I'd rather you go, because he was 10 years older, much more successful, and I said, I have a problem. It was 12 years older, in fact, and uh, uh, he was kind of a role model. We don't talk anymore, by the way. He just is one of those people that after a while you had enough of him, but in those days he gave me enough information. He said, I would take that job in a second. You're running a company. You have an opportunity. Anyway, I went to Ann Taylor when I was 35 and spent three or four years there. They were taken over by a big, bad company within six months, allied, so so on and so forth. That's my story. I went to Gap. I moved out to California. I didn't want to ever leave New York. And then uh, spent 18 years there, got fired for whatever reason. I thought it was the best thing that ever happened, and been at J. Crew since, having a lot of fun building an important team, partnering with TPG and Leonard Green. Uh, we went public. First, we partnered with TPG. We went public. And then we went private last uh, March of 2011. Uh, and that's where we are. That takes you through my entire career. Now, any questions? <laughs> OK? Because I, I'd rather just tell you what, ask me what you want to learn. Uh, I, I did say, I think M, it's the individual, not the degree. And I think here is a powerful, important group of people who get a great education, great networking, uh, so on and so forth. But people I admire. It's not, and I'm not a big one for test scores. I don't care where people graduate from college. I think taking a test, and see, I got into science. I took a test, and I did well. It had nothing, and by the way, thank God I went there, because if I didn't go there, I would have went to what is now ranked as the worst high school in the Bronx, and I started to see kids a lot smarter, especially the scientists. I was always good in math, and you do need math to run a business, but, uh, but I was very lucky I went there, because it exposed me to a whole new world outside of my zip code, 100, whatever it was in the Bronx. Uh, and that was important. So uh, that's where I am today. I have a lot of fun doing what I do. 
Uh, it's never a straight line upwards. It's always a lot of angst. You get knocked down a lot. You have to come back. You get knocked down. And people I know who are successful have this will to keep moving forward and not be, well, some of them are arrogant about it, but after a while they might earn the arrogance. But uh, in my business, every single day I was flying out here this morning, I said, you know, I've been coming out here for 10 years since I moved back to New York. Same trip every three months to Mars and Apple board meeting. I'm going to Stanford Shopping Center. I'm going to San Francisco Center. And I said, I've been doing this for so long, and every single day I learn more. I learn what's wrong, what's right, what we need to do better. How do I learn it? By talking to store people, talking to customers, and having a very curious mind, and surrounding yourselves by people who, I have two words, get it. Very hard, but if they get it, they get it, and if they don't, they don't. And no one will teach you, I don't think at the business school, what get it means. It's in the eyes of the beholder. I interview everyone in the company now who's not in IT. I don't know if anyone's in technology. Even though I'm on the board of Apple, I know nothing, and I don't know what they say and what they mean. So, uh, but I interview, <laughs> I interview everyone else in the company because it's very important. I have an obligation to like someone and like their future, and uh, especially in merchandising and marketing and, and all those things that a customer sees, I see it. And, and uh, I have an opinion on, on everything, right or wrong. And then I want people who can disagree and say what they think. OK, questions. Yes? Mickey, you made it very clear that you think that business school may be a waste of time. I, I never said it like that. <laughs> OK? I'd love for you to speak. You say if you want to run a business, start a business Well, you, you know, here's, a, here's what I feel about business school. I think, and, and I have a, a weird experience in retail. And I don't know if I'm right or wrong. And by the way, I think the job market's extraordinarily difficult today. And I also think, and I don't know if this is right, if you live and work out here or go to school out here, you see a little a different view of the world from what we might see. Because out here, you have all these young billionaires running around. A lot of them run very overvalued companies. Uh, a lot of them uh, get the right jobs. I'm sure some of you are here. Maybe you made a lot of money, and you're just hanging out for a few years. But I think the real world is not what's in uh, Northern California. So I don't know if that applies to Stanford or not. Uh, I have happened to be someone who never went to fancy schools, which is why sometimes I'm angry at fancy school people. You know, it's just natural. Uh, but I also think that the people I know who are very successful, and success defined is not being the CEO of a big corporation. Because I think a lot of CEOs get there because they're good at CEOing, they're good with boards of directors. I know a lot of CEOs today, not, not that I know them personally, but I look at their businesses and I say they shouldn't be employed. I also think that retailers should run retail companies. I think car men or women should run car companies. And I think so on and so forth. I'm always a little astounded when someone comes in to run a company who has no expertise in that category. I've been going to school now for 35, 40 years on doing what I do and trying to keep learning and being focused. And, uh, and I don't think a lot of companies or maybe CEOs realize that. And first of all, if you're a CEO, this is practical. You all want to, how many of you want to be a CEO here? Raise your hands. I'm curious. The truth. Raise your hands. The truth of a small company or of a big company. So when you get that job, and Bill lived with all of them, in most cases, and he named a group that didn't get there this way, I think. Uh, you get the private jet. Trust me, it's really a great perk. And most, <laughs> most now I don't, uh, I, I had one at Gap. I have my own now, so it's not because I didn't want to have to have a company thing. You get that, you get overpaid like crazy. You get long-term compensation, which is always more than you earn. You get stock, win or lose. In the company, you win on the restricted stock deals, right? Because it's worth whatever. So why give up the job if you have five or seven years tenure and you, and, you, uh, uh, and you retire wealthy? As opposed to people who take risk, who have their own money. We have 18 people at J. Crew. I didn't do this at Gap. We have 18 people who have cash in the business. I, I put one-third of my value when we went private. I put one-third in the business, so I bought 10% of the company because I think there's nothing like, and it's all relative, because when I was younger, I had no money. And by the way, I didn't have any money until I was 44 years old, so I want you to know that. I had no money until I was 44. Now, on Silicon Valley, it's no money until you're 28. But, uh, but the rest of us don't grow up that way unless you inherit it. And some of us in this room, I'm sure, have inherited it. But the fact of the matter is, you get those jobs, and you don't want to take the risks necessary, and this is all my opinion, to build, to invest, to take the risks of maybe losing your job. I look at the auto companies in America. Maybe someone will start to pay attention to the cars and what they look like. One of them, I think, is doing that in America. The other two, 
irrelevant what the cars look like. It's, it's an accountant who's running, it's this and that. Get a great car designer. Like John, hire Johnny Ive at Apple. I hope that doesn't happen. But get a great car designer to design a car. And you know how many they'll sell of that car? But no, it's all a matter of, and most of the cars look alike to me on the road. I remember the days where cars were unique. They were different. Or just do something that's not just black, white, and gray. Do a cool color. I went visited Ford Motor Company. when We started Old Navy, which is, by the way, named after a bar in Paris. The board of directors hated the name, but if you name your child or even I'm getting a dog in two weeks. He, she lives out here. We named it Dorothy. No one's going to tell me it's a bad or good name, Dorothy the dog. <laughs> Same thing when you start a company. No one's going to tell you if the company's a good or bad name. We hired two naming companies at Gap because someone didn't like the name Old Navy. What's the difference? You put a name on a person or on a business, and it becomes what that name is. But in fact, um, so, uh, so you have to figure out where the business is going to go, and you have to take a position. Most CEOs today, I don't think, and Bill would know this better, are willing to take the risk to bet something on the company uh, and, and who have risk at stake. You look at one retailer, I won't mention it out there today. It's a little astounding at what's going on. See, this is the part I can't talk about because he's a friend of mine. So I won't talk about that. Anyway, uh, what, so your questions on MBAs? No, no. Your question is on MBAs. The fact of the matter is it's who you are, not what your degree says. And I know a friend of mine moved from Indianapolis to New York. He's a very successful shopping center developer, the biggest, in fact. And here's the deal. We had lunch Friday, and he's saying, I don't know what to do. In New York, every kid starts, uh, and this, how many of you are from New York? Manhattan. Manhattan. How old were you when we started taking the SAT lessons for $1,000 a week or something, right? <laughs> He says, I'm from Indianapolis. You can figure out who it is. And he said, my kid's a junior, and they're starting to take the tests. And in, in New York, they start as freshmen. It's, it's a race to do well on tests, which is not an indication of how successful you'll be in life. Now, most people who get into schools test well, or they have wealthy parents. Let's call it what it is. <laughs> or they have philanthropic parents, or they know someone. So, I, so it's not against MBAs. Well, it's true, right? No, it's true. So I'm not against MBAs. I'm all for people who make a difference and are willing to have some vision, take a risk. And it's not easy when you're young. And I call all of you young because I'm much older. Uh, at 40 years old, you're probably not as young anymore. But uh, so that's, that's it. It's not against MBAs. It's just people who have reasonable expectations and don't think because they have a degree, it means they're going places. Now, I know it works in banking, I assume. It's very important in banking. I think at McKinsey it's important, right? Uh, and, but I think common sense, logic, and I call the most important things I see is IQ and EQ and street smarts and an instinct. So, and it takes time to develop that. Okay, what other questions? Keep going. Yes? You reportedly had quite an explosive personality, and apparently you sort of, you know, calmed down at, at J. Crew. And Steve Jobs, you know, had the same issue. And uh, we're taught here in the business school, you know, this very humanistic approach to management where you have to, you know, take care of all your edges not to be in any way, you know, violent to other people. And I was wondering what are you... Not to be thoughts? what? Did you say violent? Not no. violent. Say aggressive. I'm sorry, my English probably... No, is not to... No. <laughs> it's best. And so the question was, what are your thoughts on this, like, transformational CEOs like Steve Jobs and like you are transformational because of or despite of their explosive personalities? Well, uh, I, first of all, um, I, I would ask you, I, I don't know what explosive means. Here I, here's how I define Steve and I are different, very different. May he rest in peace. We're very different personalities, and I admired him more than any business person in the world. And remember, what Steve did, and no one says this, the last seven years of his life, he was fighting a disease that was probably fatal. And, and you watched what he did. And it was extraordinary. Uh, you know what I consider? I think it's all not being full of shit. That's, so if you call that explosive, if you look at someone and say what I think, or you look at the goods, first of all, the goods speak. The ideas speak. And if someone didn't, it, how many people actually say what they think? You read earnings reports. I see all these earnings reports. And stop giving me BS. Just say it wasn't the weather. Just say maybe we didn't have the right goods. Maybe we didn't have the right, uh, the, the right uh, team. Uh, and of course, you have the pressures of quarter to quarter. I don't believe I was explosive. I could not tolerate people who didn't get it. I was short on, on patience 
But if you're running a big company, you must be short on patients. The winners, whoever said I was explosive, I probably fired, right? <laughs> no, I don't know who it was. But the winners respond to honest passion in a business. I'd like to see those guys that, and I say they're all men, who run the car companies. They're always so cool about it. You know, they're always, here's the earnings, here's this, or this, that, and the other thing. There's nothing wrong with showing passion. By the way, most of us who are like that don't do well in companies. I didn't do as well in the department store business because, first of all, I couldn't stand having to play a role. Uh, but your first, look, my first 10 years, I had to make a living. I never could afford not to make a living because it just wasn't in the cards. So you had to be right, you had to play it right, and you can't be, exp and, and by the way, I don't think I was explosive. Steve was purely emotional and wasn't always the most polite guy in the world. And by the way, at the board meetings, it wasn't that easy being with Steve, but at the end of the day, when I look back and I connect the dots backwards, wow, you saw the world as it was. Uh, I think young people love people who get mad, who are passionate and who are honest, and don't sit back and don't care that much. So I, I define all that as a critically important issue in people who run successful companies. Now, if you're a corporate CEO, you've all worked for them. Uh, I've worked for them in the beginning. They are really cool. They don't sweat. They come down the escalator in the store like this. And they don't care that much. And they don't say hello a lot of the time. And, and everyone has feelings. And I always say, look, if this is the way I am, that's the way I am. And by the way, I think as long as you're respectful. So uh, I've always been respectful. But in my early days, when you're in your 30s or 40s, you're running a company that's being drained like Gap, yeah, you have to get mad. The ship's going down. At J. Crew, we came there with $750 million in debt. And you're there, and you have to save the company, and you have to take care of the people who don't meet your standards. And I think most companies have a very hard time firing the higher-ups, who in fact should be fired, because it's not them that's being hurt. It's all the people underneath them who are not respecting them or quit because the boss ain't great. So, uh, but how do you transform? You get older, you get a little richer, you don't really, you know, and you're cooler about things. <laughs> but, uh, but that's what happens. And, and I think I respect people who just, it's a passion thing for me. All right, what else? In turning around J. Crew, uh, what stories did you tell internally and externally to motivate people to kind of drive the change? What, what stories did I tell? Yeah, the company story. How did you re-motivate people? To well, you know, I, it's, it's kind of connected to this. At some point in your life, you realize the people you want working for you just want to hear what it's like. I love, I got my review at Apple on the board the other day. Uh, I got a call. <laughs> I'll say this. I, you know, I got a, I, <laughs> That, you know, we have these reviews. I got, so I had not the chairman, Art Levinson, who I love, but Bill Campbell calls me on the phone two weeks ago. He says, you're doing a great job. You know, we have these self-evaluation. He says, but. And the but was, you're on, you do email during the board meeting. And I said, you know, Bill, it's taking 12 or 13 years for someone to say that. It sounds like I'm so happy you said it. And he was dancing around it. I like the feedback. He used to give me feedback about me being a CEO at, at Gap. Now, Gap was a particularly interesting dynamic, family involvement, and you're always tightrope walking here or there. But I find that if you tell someone where they stand, especially, now, I'm older. I got to review older. I then sent an email to the board, and I said, thank you for the feedback. I was waiting for someone to stop me. I'm obsessive about getting back on my emails. But it's what happens. Someone tells you what to do, and when you're younger, and I was older, it's fine. You listen, you absorb, it's not personal, it's business, and as long as it teaches you and motivates you, the story I told outside and inside was exactly the same story. Now, I've been through it a number of times. The more you do this, the better you get. I've been practicing my craft as a CEO for 33 years. So when you practice your craft, and you get better at it, and you get better, you realize people put a premium on honesty, directness, and success. And the one thing you have to worry about if you're me going into a new job is that lip reading too much. And the last thing you want are people to lip read. But it's a, it's a style, it's a finesse, it's how you do it, but it's always direct. The best thing is be direct and let them know you care as much as they do when you're there to support them. And I always blame myself first for every mistake. 
And, and if you do that, and by the way, I like people who blame themselves first for every mistake they make, because they care the most. I don't know if that answers it, but there's the same story always because you can't make up different stories. Now, if you're a public company CEO, and I see this going on a lot, some of them tell stories that I look into, and I say, wait, the, the quarter was, well, the other thing that's uh, kind of odd is if you make expectations, the press makes it sound like you're doing well. Oh, they lost 30 million instead of 40 million. Oh, they beat expectations. Then you read the thing, say, wait, they lost money. They're doing horrible, but it's what we deal with in the public markets. It'll never change. Yes. Obviously, you were uh, very familiar with uh, TPG <laughs> due to your previous experience, but what was your rationale for wanting to go private a second time, and how are you going to create values for your private equity investors? Well, um, the, the reason for the buyout is now, because there was a lot of, one, there was one person who kept writing bad things, but I'll never forget it, but you don't, probably don't know who it is. Anyway, uh, who, I, who have since kind of apologized to me. Anyway, the reason was, that TPG and Leonard Green thought that the company was undervalued. Now, when you run a public company, especially in merchandising and fashion, the stocks, uh, I always say, you know, they have, what is it called? They, they say it's a, what's it, that thing in growth, a hockey stick growth? That's not like go to where the puck's going. Everything's hockey terms. It's like it go, no company goes like this. In retailing, it's more like a W in a sense. Uh, when the stock went from, we went public at 20, and I'm just, just background. Public at 20, up to 57, down to 8, when not 2008, up to 50, down to 20, up to 30. TPG and Leonard Green said, you know, this is a company with a great future, and Wall Street could not care less about long term. I don't care what you say. It's trading. It's, it's all that machine trading or whatever it is. It's hedge funds trading. No one cares except the management of a company who owns the company. And whether you own it or not, you care passionately about the long term because you could compromise any business in the short term. So they made an offer. There was a lot of talk about it. We got sued immediately, which happens every time. Were you in the business of like private equity or anything? TPG? See, there you go. You gave it away. <laughs> That's called EQ. Okay? So, uh, so anyway, um, and, and they made an offer at 45.50. Then it came down to 43.50. No one else offered, uh, so they bought X percent, I bought 10 percent, and the shareholders, by the way, what's interesting, you know this, the day the deal's announced, all your shareholders sell the stock. The only ones holding the stock are speculative buyers. No one cares less about, except for a nickel or a dime, et cetera, et cetera, but the rational was, they thought, to quote Leonard Green Company, we were in the third inning of a nine-inning game. They felt it was great potential. We were relatively a small company in the world, and they had a lot of faith in the management. Uh, and for me, the most important thing was keeping the management together and us having investments in the company. Uh, how do we create value? It's very simple. You grow your earnings in a high quality way over time. And having been with TPG for now a long time, and they were directors of the company, uh, I felt they were going to be great partners. I didn't want to take on the debt, but I felt very comfortable because one of my friends said to me, you will worry as much with debt or without debt. And I said, well, then we're going to do the deal. And that's why we did it. Creating value is purely creating earnings, profit, and a good future for the company. In a, my leadership perspectives class, we have a lot of CEOs come through, and they say a good leader will ultimately make themselves replaceable, whether through hiring. I don't believe that, by the way. <laughs> I don't believe it. The reason I asked, how was that Leonard Green when we did the investment? And there was with no, us? In us? Yeah. Yeah. And there was no investment with Leonard, you know, without Mickey Drexler. There's no J. Crew without Mickey Drexler. Can you comment on that? Um, well, here's what I think. I don't believe that that's, who said that? The leadership class? That's not your class, Bill, is it, or no? <laughs> By the way, I don't really believe that. I also don't believe companies go on forever. Uh, I'm not making a political statement by saying I'm not sure we should support companies or the banks that go bankrupt. I think companies get too big and they lose their edge and they become total bureaucracies. So if I look at the banks, J.P. Morgan or Goldman, they're so big, they're, they're so non-quick. There's no man, look, when J.P. Morgan or Goldman, they do those things, you think the CEOs know what the hell's going on? Now, Lloyd Blank finds a friend of mine. I don't know if they know what's going on in those large companies. I find most CEOs above it all because they have this huge bureaucracy they're running. I don't think 
most leaders are in fact replaceable. Now, the fact is, if you look at great companies, they don't last forever, nor should they. But what happens in retail now, there's international, so to speak. The cost of money is nothing. You can go on, now you know more about this than I do. You can go on managing a business because it doesn't cost to, is that, it, there's no risk. It, I mean, money's really cheap, but I don't think that companies, uh, succession planning, I always thought, even when I was a young guy in the business, I always used to laugh. Because, you know, it's like, six, Plan succession for Pablo Picasso, okay? Plan succession. Now, I said publicly, you know, Tim Cook is following Steve Jobs. And by the way, I think in any business, it takes five years to do your job well as a CEO. It, and I've been doing this for 10 years. I can't believe it's 10 years. And every day, we're building and building and building. And it never stops. Now, uh, succession planning, um, in a case like, well, who? Like Estee Lauder is an interesting case. I think they did well. They had family. Now they have a professional manager. Uh, I, I guess the issue for me, and by the way, we each have our own mission in a business. For us, it's quality. It's creativity. It's taking care of the customers in a nice way. A lot of companies out there don't care so much about that. They care quarter to quarter. Uh, but, but it's a long philosophical discussion. I don't believe in it because I've been listening to it for 40 years now. And I look at companies. And I don't know where you can say there's been a seamless, fantastic person to take over. Maybe I don't know about the banking business. It's probably easier to do the banking business than it is to do the art business if you're a painter. If you're a retailer who has a sense, it's probably more difficult to have succession. Costco, which is a great company, probably is less difficult because I think the two founders there did a spectacular job and it's a great company. I think it depends on each individual company. I know there are no rules and regulations on any of this stuff that people say. And you know, look at General Electric. Was it a bank? I never knew what Six Sigma was ever. Does anyone know what Six Sigma is? You might know. I never understood it my whole life. And I listened to the Six Sigma, and then I listened to Andy Grove once at a talk. Andy made sense. Six Sigma, I didn't understand. So if I don't understand something, I say, then it's not right. Uh, but, but uh, <laughs> It's part of, by the way, being logical and not being intimidated by what you hear is the right thing to do. It takes a long time to really say what you think. Uh, in fact, I never would have said Skyfall was a crappy movie. Now I can say whatever I want to say, <laughs> you know? And I think with CEO succession, but you tell me, give me the great examples of CEO succession. This place is named for Phil Knight. I don't think there's been great succession there. Phil Knight, who I didn't know personally, was an extraordinary business builder. So I, I don't know. I, I think things change. What does that mean for Apple without Steve Jobs? Time will tell. Time will tell. And, uh, and, and when you do what Steve Jobs does, you'd hate to follow him into a job. Let's face it, it's much easier to take over a company that's not doing well. You know what I mean? Instead of one that plays the game that way. Time will tell on that. And it will be who knows how much time. OK. Who, someone was, you're in charge of the questions? OK, go ahead. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the potential that you think um, the fashion industry could play in addressing some of the biggest issues facing the world, such as poverty. And have you seen any exciting business models or interventions from brands in the fashion industry um, that are addressing these issues or have some promise there? Well, you know, that's not my pay grade. Uh, because I think in terms of addressing poverty, I wouldn't even know where to begin because you can say fashion industry, car industry, any industry. You can say the values in America. You could say the tax system. You could say sharing. Uh, uh, and I don't want to, to me, it's, it's, not, it's not the fashion industry's job except to increase employment uh, and increase the economy, have ta the tax system being fair. Why should private equity pay 15% or hedge funds? I don't have an answer. It's really not my pay grade. But I think, um, and by the way, I think it's critical. I don't think anyone pays much attention to that. Or how about education? Because poverty comes perhaps from lack of education. Uh, and, uh, but I, I think the world is in a place that maybe it needs to be changed in that regard. I think the priorities have to be changed in America. You saw the, the campaign and whatever. But I, I don't know how the fashion industry can do that without the world changing. It's, we're just a very tiny piece of it. I don't know if that answers it, but well, talk about TFA. TFA, what about it? Well, just you know, that's so, where you went. 
Well, no, I'm on the board of Teach for America, but uh, trying to get funding even for Teach for America. I, I love Teach for America. I love Wendy Kopp. And, and for, me, for me personally, my wife and I, we support poor kids who need an education. I identify a little with that growing up in the Bronx, but I think education today is the most politicized thing in the world. Now, I'm not an expert, but, uh, but you're dealing with lots of issues that uh, maybe people are afraid to stand up on. I think the priorities are so misspent in America. You know, so rich people pay more taxes, big effing deal, right? And I don't know, Bill would know better if in fact having rich people pay more taxes means that it's not going to grow the economy as much so people can't buy $50 million paintings. I don't understand that. But it's not my pay grade. All right, so. Lately we've seen quite a few brands and retailers that have begun and exist entirely online. So is there anything you could talk a little about the future of online retailing? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Well, online to me is a hugely disruptive force. By the way, I never heard of, until today, Uber Taxi. <laughs> you guys all know about it? You, you know, what I've been saying in my business, and by the way, if I'm going too long in this, just cut me off, because whatever. What I've been saying in my industry, when I was a buyer at Bloomingdale's, there was no online, there were discount stores. And when you bought a brand, let's say it was Nike or whatever, I bought women's sportswear and swimwear and t-shirts. If you bought a brand and it was at the discount store down the road, you had to, it was our policy, meet their price. Now, fast forward 30 plus years. Online is disrupting the world as it is right now. And I find that, uh, and, and when I was, when I went to Gap and sacked at Ann Taylor in, in 19, I went to Ann Taylor in 19, it's a long time ago, 1980. Yeah, 1980. We started to create, I took a, a model of uh, Benetton and Brooks Brothers. Brooks Brothers had the same parent company as we did, Allied Stores, disaster. No, it was actually a Garfinkel Brooks Brothers. And I said, gee, here's Brooks Brothers. They don't have to worry about carrying any brands that people are marking down. And I, I don't know, you know, you connect the dots backwards. I don't know if in my head it was, wow, they had 16% pre-tax earnings. And it was, again, I, it was connecting it backwards. I said, well, I want to be like Brooks Brothers because I don't have to worry about buying all the brands at a discounter. And then it wasn't like it is today. You go online right now. Best Buy probably won't be in business, I don't think. But I don't know what you all think about that. So. So for me, my whole career is based on exclusivity or controlling your distribution. Now, Steve Jobs, when I first met Steve 15 years ago, he said, I want to be like Gap and have my own stores. I thought he was nuts, because I knew we did it because at Ann Taylor, we started to go to our own label, Ann Taylor Studio, because I didn't want to have what everyone else had. And it's happened dramatically today. I mean, the world has moved forward that way so much where everyone has the same goods. Steve came, and then I went to Gap. And at Gap, they had 20 different names. Levi's was one third of the company's volume. And Levi's was low margin, and everyone carried Levi's, everyone discounted it. I didn't know any better. I was a young guy. I came in to run this public company. The earnings always drop. And I did say that to the guy we were talking about today. That when you take over a company, the first year, your earnings are going to drop at least half. They forecasted flat earnings. The earnings will drop because you're cleaning out old inventory and you're betting and rebetting the company. So, uh, so at Gap, we went to Gap only. We had 20 different names, and the survey said this. By the way, I don't do research on what the customer wants. I'm sure some of you, you're in the research business. I don't know if you are or not. Uh, I find it, no one will tell you where the puck is going. They'll always tell you where it is. I went to Ford Motor Company in 1994 and visited with the then CEO. So I had a friend on the board. We wanted to do a little old Navy truck. They brought out these very cool trucks. They said the customers told us they didn't like them. And then they were telling us colors that the customers did not like. And I'm thinking, this is bizarre. Anyway, Gap, we had Gap brand. Uh, and we controlled it completely. Levi's finally said they didn't want to sell us. I was a little nervous. I said, fine. You know something? There's opportunity in the midst of adversity. Um, Steve came when I met Steve and whenever this was. He said, I want to open up Apple stores because I can't depend upon distribution of my product at Best Buy, who's still in business, and name the rest of them are all gone. And he couldn't control his image. He couldn't control anything. Here comes online now. You go online, and I do this as a matter of practice, and everyone in our company does this now. If there's a brand, you want to pay the best price. Amazon ships really well. 
Cosmetics America ships it well. Target ships it well if it's in a box. I called the CEO of one of my former companies I was a director of, and I said, by the way, your goods are one third more than they are at Target or Amazon. Oh, we, we didn't catch that brand. You go look at a brand today. I think they're all commodities. Every single brand is a commodity. You got Gilt, you got all the discounts, TJ Maxx, Ross stores, they're all selling goods at discount. So what do I think of online? It's a huge disruptive force, just like Uber Taxi, which I only, a friend of mine, I flew out with a friend of mine, and he was telling me that he, he has an Uber Taxi app. I never heard of that in my life. He says it's unbelievable. They have them out here. I guess they have them in New York. And there's so many disruptive forces in the world. So what I think of online, it's going to keep changing the landscape dramatically. And I think it's going to start to put a lot of people at risk in the business. And it is right now. Uh, because I don't ever want to be in a business where I have to wake up every day worrying about someone selling it for a better price. Because I know for me, it's not what I want to do. And I wouldn't be the best at it. So now you've got Amazon, who maybe they can afford to have a 200 multiple and not make any money, whatever it is. They just announced last week they're going after the apparel business. They're opening studios in New York. So I think it's one of the biggest disruptive forces that in our business, and I don't know about other businesses, people aren't paying that much attention to, or they're not admitting to it. We go online and we buy a lot of stuff. And my wife in cosmetics or whatever else she might buy. And it's a matter of practice. You shop right here. You find out the best price. It comes in the same box. It gets delivered. There's no servicing. When I ask my fellow, they're not really friends of mine. They all don't like me that much in the department store business because I don't like the department store business because I say, what do they do better than other people? And all the stuff they sell is available somewhere else. You look at every designer name, every brand name, and you will see it's sold at a discount. It's hard not to find it at a discount. So I don't know how long it's going to take. Who knows? But it's a hugely disruptive force. And you probably know a lot more about that because you probably live more online than I do. But we're very sensitive to that. And that's why we don't want to build anything that's available at a lesser price because at some point it's going to catch up and bite you hard. I probably left some things out there, but I don't know. So that's what I think. OK, who else is next? <laughs> Two things. First, um, fashion is such a small part, uh, part you said, in, in big problems, actually. Uh, I'm sure you're aware, fashion is actually the second most polluting in the industry. Mes uh, the second, second most, most polluting industry I'm not in the aware. world. I'm not aware. After oil uh, and gas. How did, uh, what survey tells you that? <laughs> well, it, I think it's just... Because you, you know look, something I don't believe in until you show me the, re the facts. Sure, let's walk through the whole value chain. Uh, cotton growth. Uh, I mean... Uh, but I'll uh, take it. For this purpose, okay, we'll pes take it. Go pesticides, <laughs> okay. chemicals... Colors, dyes, all oh, that. Good. So there's huge potential uh, we can do in the fashion industry. However, my question was more now to what you did, particularly in terms of branding, because I think um, the way you reshaped the gap, but now also J. Crew. Uh, J. Crew has come to a point. You look at a, uh, a mailer, you look at the website, you, you look at any piece, and it just looks consistent. You know it's J. Crew. And I feel like, how do you? do that in a company that big that goes through so many consumer touch points, how do you define it's a really this good really question. point of view that you have succeeded to refine so well? You, you know, it's a really good question. Um, and it's really not that big of a company. If you came and visited us, you will see that it's just, I don't think it's that big. And I think the focus, and this is what a CEO does. See, I used to get criticized for micromanaging. Steve is a terrible micromanager. I look at everything you see, and if I don't see it, and it passes by me, and I don't like it, I'm furious, because I, I didn't partner in it. I, I saw something online today I wasn't aware that we did, and it drove me a little crazy. But uh, it's, if, you, if, if you hire, what? Well, I have a loud speaker, by the way. <laughs> so I, wherever I am, I call out all over the world. And, and by the way, it's. There's 1,000 people at 770. I think every company shouldn't be allowed to have walls in their offices. And they should have loudspeakers. Because I'm on the phone all day. And if I go into Stanford today or San Francisco Center, and I called out the fact that I thought the necklaces were whatever, and this is whatever. Uh, but uh, I am a micromanager on the finest detail on what you see as a customer. Then, by the way, it's not just me. Jenna Lyons, uh, Diego Scotti. Uh, Tracy, the team, uh, you must have a sense of people who get it and understand the vibe of the brand. 
That's really, really important. And it's, it takes a lot of work to get the people who kind of move with you and get it and feel it. But uh, I say whatever a customer sees is really my job and their job. Uh, but, but we go through every, every email. Every, if you look at the catalog, I should have had the catalogs here. I don't have the brand new catalog. We look at those as if we're publishing a magazine every week, every style, every outfit, every cover. And by the way, we screw up. We screwed up why, why we're private, because we screwed up two years ago on, it was too late. By the time I look at the catalog, it's pretty much there. I looked at the cover of July 2010, and I prayed. I said, holy shit, we're in trouble. And we all knew that. I'll never forget, there was this woman lying down, looking very weird and un-J crew-like. And, and that's a really big issue. But you do it because you know how to focus out all unimportant things in your life. I don't spend time with IT people. I spend time in the stores like crazy. I look at everything visual. I look at all the styles in the company. Uh, and I do that. And I love what I do. But it's, it's what your job is as a CEO. If the guys who ran, and I say the men, they need some good women in the car industry for style. If the guys who ran the car companies looked at the design of those cars and said, why did they do this? But look at the movie industry. How do they allow those movies to go out? Maybe there's no vision, or maybe they're trying to make the movies longer, and they think they'll get more business. I don't know. I'm a big complainer and vetcher about that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a vision, following it, being consistent. I haven't seen Mercedes change that star in 100 years. I don't know what a GM car looks like anymore, or a Chrysler anymore, or a lot of other cars. Or the Toyota has that little thing like this or Audi, or BMW, or the Mini is a very well-designed car. Even the Fiat has the badge. It's consistency and advertising and everything else you do. I, I could answer this for hours, but all right, what's? So you talked about how um, it took you until you were 44 to be at least financially successful. Well, it's all relative. <laughs> um, so Maybe 43, I think. It was 42, actually. Go ahead. All right, then I don't have I a question. I still have the check. OK, go ahead. So uh, a lot of us I here, was a late bloomer. Go ahead. It's OK. A lot of us here probably don't want to wait until we're 44 I know that. to be I know. successful. I know. Um, I know. And I think you know, a lot of the But you'll have to. You have no choice. If you look well, at it statistically, what's your name? Henry. Where are you from, East Coast? Yeah. I figured. <laughs> okay, go ahead. It's, it's the money thing. Go ahead. My, my parents, they ask you, go to this school at the West Coast. You're supposed to be a billionaire by the time you're 28. And where, where are you from in New York? I'm from Washington, D.C. Okay, so. it's the same thing. Um, right. <laughs> Not really. Go ahead. So um, you all, um, could you talk a little bit more about certain key decisions, um, setbacks, um, key moments in your life, in your career to... Uh, making it to where you are today, yeah. um, and potential advice on those of us who are trying to become billionaires okay. at 28 versus... Well, if, if, by the way, I never tried to get rich, and, and I'm serious. I, I, I only wanted to have a nice car, have a home. No, I'm I grew up in the Bronx, you know, without a bedroom, whatever. It's all relative, and, uh, and I think that's a really good question, but it's, again, it's personally for me, because I don't understand, and nor should I, what, how you all think today, or how my children think, which is different perhaps than I thought. Because when I grew up, you had to go to work, uh, unless, well, most people, there weren't that many rich kids around then. You know, because, you know, I was the second generation, whatever. My grandparents were from Poland. But uh, I think today, uh, don't be disappointed because you won't be a billionaire by the time you're 20. Or in this room, when I went to college, you said, look to the left, look to the right. Do they still say that? And, <laughs> Not here. <laughs> right. no, here uh, they say, look to your left, look to your right. They're going to be billionaires. Oh, I see. Look to you. But, but I think one of the things about, and, you're, and you have a competitive school back east that's terribly arrogant about this. You know who they are, right? <laughs> um, but, but for me, uh, it, I had a different outlook. And it wasn't like in 2000, I'll never forget, running Gap. And all of a sudden, Silicon Valley had that bubble. And I'm looking at these. And by the way, today also, I think the hedge fund wealth is really out of control. I think it's crazy. Is there an improvement? See, it's kind of how do you help poverty? By having people trade stocks and not create jobs? That's something that doesn't help. Uh, I think when you build things like Google or you know, whatever else gets built, Facebook, or great companies that hire a lot of people, that creates jobs. Personally, look, I, I went to work at Bloomingdale's. 
After two years, I said, shit, I don't like this anymore. I don't really trust. Four years, I was making a living. I couldn't quit. And by the way, I don't, I don't know how many, how many of you could afford to quit a job and not work. I don't know how many can. So you're always looking for a job when you're working. Then I went to Macy's. That was a real disaster. I was there three weeks, and I said, oh, God, this is a mistake. I didn't think about it, because when you have an economic need, you don't have the luxury of saying, oh, I'm going to quit. And then I was worried about resume stuff, and you didn't want to quit that soon. Then I left Macy's. I went back to Federated, which owned a and &S. I got there and said, this is another mistake. Then I got depressed. I was always a little anxious during each day and each job. And then I got a little depressed and said, I'm now 34 years old. I was making an OK living until, by the way, I looked over the desk and I saw some of my cohorts. One in particular was making 30% more than I was because he was hired from the outside. I got fucking furious. And I said, if he thinks, you know, it was like the 10 and a half thousand to the 11,000, those are all points in your life where you'll make mistakes. And you at some point realize, if you're going to work in companies where they're judging you incorrectly, then you shouldn't be there. And you got to find the right place to work. So I went to work at Ann Taylor. I thought it was a big risk I was taking. I didn't go for a big raise. I went to work. I ran a company. I learned on the ground. I was very lucky. It was a $25 million company then. My bosses were all one only worried about is cleaning and washing in D.C. Brooks Brothers was based, Garfinkel Miller Roads was based on K Street. And I'll never forget. I said, go down there. And the president of the corporation only worried about his dry cleaning. I swear to God, this is true. <laughs> He'd say to his assistant, did you get my dry cleaning today? <laughs> this is what he did. It was a riot. But they didn't pay attention because they owned the departments through here and there. I, I had, we had taken over in six months. I stayed for four years, not for the money, because there was no such thing as big stock options. And then I had to get out. I wanted to be in New York because I love New York City. I ended up at Gap. Why? For, that's a whole other long answer. But I had setbacks in Gap. I was there a year. I told my chairman to go F himself. And then I called my wife and said, we have no money. I didn't say it first. I'm here in New York. We don't have a place to live. And I told him, you know the fights I used to have with him, right? It was all these friendly, lovely fights or whatever. And, and we ended up being great partners, by the way, I might add, because it was yin and yang. But uh, I could name so many periods in my life when you get your ass kicked, you don't feel that good, and then you've got to follow your vision, you've got to follow your path. And when you connect the dots backwards, you realize you're doing the right thing. But if you, if you stay in your job and you get very comfortable, and most of the, the people I worked with, my equals and peers, I really, it's a very small percent of the success ratio as I measure it, is very small because no one took the risk of taking a position. Now, I moved 3,000 miles away, and I paid a big price for it, because I'm a New Yorker. By birth, by DNA, it's like taking an animal out of the woods and putting him into a zoo, whatever animals feel. I don't know how they feel, but I feel badly for them. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and it was the same thing. I had a terrible transition, personally and professionally, into an environment overlooking 280 and a cemetery. And I was on 57th and 5th in Manhattan, trying to be a big shot. Uh, so you pay the price, but you know something? It's over the long term that you make these kinds of sacrifices, and it's never, ever easy, especially, well, it's normally never easy, and don't plan on being a billionaire. And by the way, three or four hundred million is enough. <laughs> okay, that's it. So.